lesson we're going to introduce the concept of resource markets and talk about how firms demand for resources is determined in a resource market by the marginal revenue product of the resource being employed. So we need to do some review from earlier on in your course. We need to review what the concept of resource markets is. You learned earlier on that there are two places where buyers and sellers interact with one another in a market economy. There are product markets, which you've probably already studied. This is where households demand goods and services from firms in exchange for money. There are also resource markets. Resource markets are where firms hire workers, capital, and land from households in exchange for money incomes. You probably learned what those money incomes are called. For labor, households receive wages. For land, households receive rent. And for their capital, the money we put in the bank, which is, late, which is then passed on to firms in the form of loans, we earn interest. We're going to be focusing mostly on labor markets in the next few lessons, in which wages are determined by the demand for labor and the supply of labor by firms. So what's different between resource markets and product markets is the roles are reversed. Households are now the suppliers and firms are now the demanders. Firms demand resources in order to produce the goods and services that they then sell to households in the product market. So what determines a firm's demand for a resource? There are basically two things that can affect the demand for a resource by firms. One is the price of the good being produced. And the other is the productivity of the resource being employed. To illustrate this, we're going to look at the productivity table for an individual perfectly competitive bakery. You learned earlier on that a perfect competitor is what we call a price taker. Therefore, a perfectly competitive bakery can sell each loaf of bread that it produces for a market price of $5, as we can see in the table. What we're going to do is determine this individual baker's demand for labor by comparing the marginal product of labor, in other words, how much bread each additional worker that the bakery hires produces and multiplying that by the price the bakery can sell each loaf of bread for. First let's calculate the marginal product of labor. Notice that in the left here we have the number of workers employed from 1 to 7 and the output produced in total by all the workers from 6 for the first worker up to 21 when 7 workers are employed. But what we want to know is what's the marginal product. You've probably learned earlier on in the course that marginal product is the change in total product or output divided by the change in the number of workers or the quantity of labor. Very simple calculation here. All we need to do is see how much total output changes for each additional worker hired. The first worker contributes six loaves of bread. As we see, as employment goes up to two, the output increases to 11 for a marginal product of five because 11 minus 6 equals 5. Output then goes up to 15, giving the firm a marginal product of 4 for the third worker, and so on. The fourth worker contributes three additional loaves of bread. The fifth worker contributes two additional loaves of bread. The sixth worker, only one loaf of bread. And the seventh worker, no additional loaves of bread. So one thing you may be wondering is, why does marginal product decrease? Well, you may also remember the concept of di diminishing marginal returns. This is the idea that as a firm employs more of a variable resource, in this case labor, in the short run, when there are fixed resources, which in the case of my bakery is the size of my bakery and the number of ovens that I have, the output attributable to additional workers diminishes. This is because there's not enough capital, there's not enough space for these workers to become more productive as we hire more of them. They just get in each other's way. You've probably heard the term, too many cooks spoil the broth. This is the quantitative illustration of that concept. So the question now is, how much should the firm be willing to pay the first worker, the second worker, the third worker, and so on? And that's where the term marginal revenue product comes in. Our marginal revenue product is very simply the marginal product of labor times the price of the good being produced. So what we're looking at is how much output did each worker that we hired produce and how much were we able to sell that output for. So what we're going to do is multiply the marginal product times the price of bread. The first worker produced six loaves of bread which the bakery could sell for five dollars per loaf earning the bakery a total of thirty dollars in revenues for the first worker hired. 
the second worker contributed five loaves of bread, we multiply that by the price of five for a marginal revenue product of $25 and so on. I'm going to go ahead and calculate the marginal revenue products for each of these workers down to the seventh worker. So what do we see here? We see that as the firm employs more workers, the revenue generated by each additional worker decreases. It's pretty easy to understand why. While the price of bread stays the same, the productivity of additional workers decreases. Therefore, the amount of revenue each additional worker can earn the firm falls. Let's just take some notes here. So as employment, as employment increases, the revenues generated by additional workers decreases. You should start to be seeing how this explains the demand for labor. Workers are less productive as we hire more of them. Therefore, firms are willing to pay less for each additional worker. Let's look down at our demand for labor graph for the individual bakeries demand for labor. I need to put some labels on this. On the horizontal axis, I'm going to be looking at the quantity of labor. In other words, the number of workers. On the vertical axis, I'll be looking at the marginal revenue product. In other words, the amount of revenue each worker that the firm hired contributed to the firm's total revenues. And we're going to also look at that as the wage rate, because this is also going to tell us how much the firm would be willing to pay each of these workers. We're going to go from one worker to seven. So let's put the labels here. And we can see that the marginal revenue product peaked at $30 and it fell down to $0. So I'm going to put some values here. We'll go 3, 9, 12, 15, 18, 21, 24, 27, and 30. And all I need to do is plot the points from my table up here. At one worker, the marginal revenue product, the revenue that that worker contributed to the firm was $30. And at seven workers, the revenue contributed was $0. And since this is linear, all I need to do is plot those two points. So at one, the revenue was $30. Let's connect those points. All right, we've now got our marginal revenue product of labor for my individual bakery. What this line tells me is how much the bakery would be willing to pay each of the workers from the first worker to the seventh worker. Notice that when the marginal revenue product is high, the first worker who contributed six loaves of bread, which could be sold for $5 each, earning the firm $30, the firm would be willing to pay that worker up to $30. But the second worker only contributed five loaves of bread which were sold for $5 a piece, earning the baker at only $25 in revenues. Therefore, for the second worker, the maximum wage the bakery would be willing to pay is $25. And we can see that that continues. At lower wage rates, the bakery would be willing to hire more workers because additional workers earned less additional revenue. This bakery would, in fact, only be willing to hire a sixth worker if he could pay that worker as low as $5. Because as you can see, the marginal revenue product or the revenue earned by the sixth worker is only $5 and so on. There's no way this bakery would want to hire seven workers because the marginal revenue product of the seventh worker is zero. So unless that worker were willing to work for free, there's no reason to hire that worker. This is our demand for labor curve. It's a very simple graph, guys. The marginal revenue product tells the firm how much wage rate the firm would be willing to pay each additional worker. And notice that it's downward sloping. So that means as wage rate falls, the quantity demanded of labor increases because marginal revenue product falls as employment increases. Marginal revenue product is the individual firm's demand for labor. Going back to our original notes here, we can see that the marginal revenue product tells the firm how much each additional worker will earn that firm in revenue. As employment increases, marginal revenue product decreases due to the law of diminishing marginal returns. Therefore, firms are only willing to hire more workers if the wage rate they have to pay those workers decreases.
This, again, sounds a lot like the law of demand from earlier on in microeconomics, which says there's an inverse relationship between the price of a good and the quantity of that good demanded. The same is true in resource markets. There's an inverse relationship between the price of a resource, in this case, wages for workers, and the quantity of that resource that firms will demand due to the law of diminishing marginal returns and the fact that the revenue attributable to additional units of a variable resource decreases as the employment of that resource increases. Here we go.